Uh, all right, Genesis 28, and our text is going to be uh, from verse 19. Uh, but uh, before we get into that, uh, just once, one of the old writers, uh, Mr. Thomas Brooks, he once made this statement. He said that truly, that truly, he that truly believes and receives the Lord Jesus Christ as his Redeemer and Lord, shall be saved, be his sins never so many. He that believes not on him and receives not the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, as his Redeemer, shall be damned, be his sins never so few. The issue is Christ. Our Lord gathered his disciples together about him after his resurrection. And he told them, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. All power is given unto me. I'll be with you. I have all power. I have all authority over all flesh. You go preach. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be condemned or shall be damned. He who truly not professes, but truly believes on Christ and receives him as Lord, as his Lord and Redeemer, who has a saving experience, a saving union with the Redeemer, who's been born again, shall be saved. He be his sins, never so many, but he that believeth not on Christ and receiveth not Christ as his Lord shall be damned, be his sins never so few. Believers and unbelievers have one thing in common. And that one thing in common is that we're all sinners. Turn to Romans chapter 3 with me, if you will. This is the one thing that all men have in common, that we're all sinners. None of us, though, are as bad as we can be. We're all restrained by the hand of God. None as wicked as we could be. Our full potential to sin is not yet realized, not, is not realized because God Almighty stays us. It's his restraining grace. He keeps us from this, but the potential is there for every son of Adam. Just because we might not act as wicked as somebody else doesn't give us the reason to be proud. And we shouldn't praise ourselves. It's God restraining grace. The potential is there. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, look at verse 10. He says this, As it's written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. And just in case you didn't catch the four, first four nuns, no, not one. Turn to Isaiah chapter 64 with me. Isaiah 64, and listen to the prophet Isaiah. In verses 6 through 8, Isaiah wrote this. He said, Isaiah, Isaiah 64, verse, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon the na thy name, that stirreth, stirreth up thyself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, John writes, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So we have this one thing in common, all, all men and women. All thing we have in common, and that is we're sinners. We are descendants of Adam, and being descendants of Adam, we have received his nature, the results of his rebellion. We are dead in trespasses and sins, and we're enemies of Almighty God. We love that which we ought to hate. We hate that which we ought to love. We call that which is bitter sweet and that which is sweet bitter. We are 180 degrees in direct opposition to God by nature. 
but that which marks a true believer. That which marks a true believer in Christ. That which a true believer in Christ has as an evidence that God has by his grace redeemed them. Number one, he has a true knowledge of sin as it appears in the light of God's holiness. He has a true knowledge of sin in the light as it appears, uh, appears in the light of God's holiness. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were very careful about the outward forms of religion, the ceremonies of religion, the outward duties of the law, the outward obedience to the law. They held the law in high esteem. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt take not take the name of the Lord, uh, Lord God in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. They honored that, and, and it was very, they, they esteemed it very highly. They were very careful about these laws and the duties of religion, ceremonial laws and so forth. In keeping of the Sabbath, they were very moral men. They were very careful in keeping all these responsibilities and duties. One day, our Lord was preaching this, and this was recorded in Matthew chapter 15. He said, it's not that which goeth into the mouth that defiles a man. It is that which comes from the heart. To eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Defileth not a man. After he talked about this, the disciples came up to him, our Lord, and they said, the Pharisees were offended by what you said. They were upset at what you said. The Lord then began to explain. He said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. And he told them to leave them alone. Leave them alone. They'd be, they'd be blind leaders of the blind. Then Peter asked them, he said, declare unto us this parable. I don't understand. We don't understand. De declare unto us this parable. That's when our Lord said, Are you without understanding? Whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out the draft. But those things which proceeded out of the mouth, proceed out of the mouth, come forth from the heart. Those things such as evil thoughts and blasphemy and adultery, fornication, evil concupiscence, lasciviousness, these are the things that defile, that corrupt. The man. And the Pharisees did not understand sin. That was the bottom line. They didn't understand it. The disciples by the Lord were taught the meaning of sin. And so are all true believers taught what sin is. Sin understood in the light of God's holiness. We have seen it, we've seen sin as it appears in the light of his holiness. Not in the light of reputation, in the light of public opinion, not in those things in the light of some church rule or standard. See, God's love. We're not love. God's love. We do not understand anything about that kind of love. God is pure love. He's infinite love. He's everlasting love. God's love. And God is mercy. He's grace. And he is righteous. Isaiah the prophet said, When King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the cherubims and pharisims were about the throne of God and cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Then, then, then cried I, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He saw the Lord in his holiness. He saw sin and evil in the light of God's holiness. Job was an upright. Job... We know about Job. He, God called him righteous. He was an upright, moral man. In fact, Job defended his morality. He defended his integrity. He said, I'll not let go of my integrity. I've treated people right. I've ordered my house right. I've conducted my life right. And I've been a good example to all those about me. Then God appeared to him. He appeared to him in a whirlwind. And revealed to Job his glory, his wisdom, and his power. Then Job said this, and not until then, Lord, I've heard you by the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, and I hate myself. Once have I spoken, yea, twice, things too wonderful for me, things I did not understand. I put a seal on my lips, I shut my mouth, 
I hate myself. Now that's what Job said. The true believer to sin or to him sin has ceased to be a set of rules, to be a set of laws and a standard handed down. Sin becomes an offense against the character, against the government, and against the person of God, his Lord. He sees sin in the light of God's holiness. David said in Psalm 51, O God, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, creating me a new heart, creating me or renew within me a right spirit. Within me, that's where the work needs to be done. This work is his workmanship. It's God's workmanship. What the Holy Spirit does within us is the fruit of the complete redemptive work our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross of Calvary. Every bit of it. Have we seen sin in the light of God's holiness? If we have, the Holy Spirit has shown us that. A man or woman will never mourn or weep over sin until they've seen sin in the light of God's holiness. What makes sin so wretched and evil is it is against God. That's what makes it so wretched and evil. Again, he has a true knowledge of sin in the light of God's holiness. He sees his pride in the light of God's holiness, in the light of Christ's humility. He sees the hatred in the light of Christ's love. It would do us, a, it would do us good if sometime we would think about this. When our heart, when our pride starts to well up, and we swell up with pride, or when we think of our rights, anytime our rights have been violated, it would be good for us to think of this. Our Lord, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, became obedient unto death, took the form of a servant, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's humility. We would think about our pride and our rights in the light of his rights and his holiness and his humility. It will make us ashamed. Makes us ashamed. Think about when someone says something about us and, or did something to us that we didn't deserve and we feel that our, our rights were violated or we were violated. And we feel that that person ought to suffer the greatest penalty for this. Think about this sometimes. When our Lord was nailed to the cross, he looked down to the face of that soldier who, sp who spit in his face. And he said, Father, forgive him. He knows not what he had done. When he stood on the mountain over Jerusalem, he said, How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. When I see my get even spirit, my vengeful spirit, it makes me ashamed. I see my sin in the light of his holiness. Our Lord was led as a sheep before the shears is dumb. He was led. They brought all kinds of false charges against him. And he didn't turn and say, that's not so. When reviled, he reviled not again. Anybody knows it's wrong to take the Lord's name in vain. Anybody knows it's wrong to commit adultery. Anybody knows it's wrong to steal. Anybody knows it's wrong to kill or wrong to, to lie? Anybody knows that? A person feels bad because they lied on someone. They haven't learned anything with that. We haven't learned anything when we learn that. Our children know that. They may never ever read the Bible. They know that. When you and I come to see sin and regard and think about sin as an attitude, a spirit, a principle that is against God Almighty and his holiness, we see ourselves. I to love my greatest enemy in the flesh. God loves me, and I was his enemy. I ought to be able to forgive. If I know anything about God's righteousness, if I know anything about his mercy, I ought to be able to, to forgive the greatest offense ever committed against me. I ought to be able to. And not harbor any ill or ill will or malice or ill feelings. But forgive it, erase it, forget it, and bless that person. Our Lord said to bless them that persecute you. Now, why can't we do that? Why can't we do that? Well, the, here's the reason. The true believer is a sinner and knows it. But he sees sin and regards sin and considers it not in the written letter of God, not in the written law of God. The law is spiritual, 
and it convicts and strips a person and reveals sin in a summary of the whole character of God. But believer, a believer considers sin, not in the light of thou shalt not, but in the light of thou shalt. Paul said this in Romans chapter 3. He said, we have sinned and come short of God's what? His glory. The Ten Commandments? No. The moral law? No, he didn't say that. We come short of God's glory. Every time. What is, that's my problem. That's our problem. What is God's glory? Well, it's his goodness. God's glory is his goodness. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. He had seen the Ten Commandments. He had even received the Ten Commandments. He'd seen all that. That was in Exodus 20. And uh, he received the tables of stone. But later on, Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory. Paul said, I've sinned and come short of God's glory. So Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, this was his answer, I will be gracious, I will be merciful. That's his glory. How much mercy and grace do we have? Don't answer that. We love those that love us, but Christ said, what thank have you? We give to them whom we, have, we hope to have something in return. But again, what thank have you? We bless them that bless us. We pray for those in our family and those that we have close relationships with, but what thank have you? Our Lord said, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you, that you might be children of your Father which is in heaven. And if any man forgive not others their trespasses, neither will I forgive you, the Father forgive you, your trespasses. Now, I've sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the true believer's conflict with sin, his wrestlings with sin, and his repentance over sin, his conviction of sin, and his troubles with sin is considered in the light of God's glory, God's holiness, God's love, God's mercy, and his grace. And every one of those are in his dear beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we see him, we see ourselves. And the question is, what think ye of Christ? What think ye of Christ? He's the issue. He's the difference. Let's look at the second thing that marks a true believer. That was number one. The second thing that marks a true believer is a true desire to be done with sin and to live for, the glory, for God's glory. David said, I shall be satisfied. What would, you, what, would, what would it take to totally satisfy us? Well, David said, I shall be satisfied when I wake with his likeness. This is the object of the believer's faith. We talked about that in the last message. The great petition of a believer is to be like Christ because he's the object of God's covenant. He's the object of God's predestination, and he's the object of Christ's incarnation. This is the object of Christ's redemption. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's why he came. He said, I came to seek and to save the lost. I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's why he came. This is the object of his resurrection. This is the object of his intercession. This is the object of his coming again. That's where I, he says that where I am, you may also be, or may be also. That's why I came. That is why he came. That's why he came. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 with me. Let's look at that. Ephesians chapter 1. He came to make us like himself. Ephesians chapter 1, that's what it's all about. The great petition for a believer is not to go to heaven. The great petition of a believer is not to determine if the circle be unbroken. The one great petition, object, desire of a believer is to be like Christ. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. Now that's why he chose us, that we should be holy. Not that he should populate heaven only, 
but that he might have a people like his son. That's why he chose you. That is the object of election. Read on. So we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children. You know, he's going to have some sons. He's going to have some children. They're all going to be one day like Christ. We're going to be, we're going to, we're going to like what he likes. We're going to rejoice in what he rejoices in. We're going to enjoy the things he enjoys because we're going to be like Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 8 with me while you're, while you're turn, or turn to Romans chapter 8 with me. And we'll see that again here in Romans chapter 8. We, um, verse 29, look at that. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, that's what it's all about. That's God's object, and, our, and if our objective and God's objective is not the same, then we're not walking together. Many are preaching the goal of all this in this day is to go to heaven, to be in heaven. And you know that's a desirable goal. There's no question about it. We know that we would rather be in heaven than in hell. So that's a desirable goal. But they're preaching the goal of all this to be rewards that we're going to get, the riches in heaven, the mansions that we're going to live in, the streets of gold we're going to walk on, also about the wealth that we're going to have, and, and things that we're not going to have, such as pain and, and, and sickness and death. But the goal of all this is, is that we are going to be like Christ. And that is our objective. The true believer has a desire to be done with sin. He longs for the day when he shall awake with Christ's likeness. And thirdly, that which marks a true believer is a definite confidence and a definite committal to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 with me. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Listen to Paul here. Some say this is the best definition of faith. I, I'm not sure. It, 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 may, it very well may be. But 2 Timothy... Chapter 1 and verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, that day of judgment and wrath and condemnation. There's a threefold definition of faith right there in that verse. And, and by the way, a good definition of a true believer is found in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, which reads, we are the circumcision, we are the true believers, we're the sheep, the Israel of God, the elect of God, which worship God in the spirit. In other words, we worship God from the heart, that which he reveals to us about himself. And we rejoice, we have confidence, we boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in this flesh. That's a good definition of a believer, but... Uh, but in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, there's a threefold definition of faith. First of all, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. I know whom. I know who he is. He's God Almighty, the Son of Man. I know that God sent him to be my Redeemer, to come down here on purpose and bear my sin and my shame and to face the law and to obey it perfectly. I know that. To fulfill the law. I know who he is. I know from whence he came. I know what he came to do, and I know why he came to do it, that God may be just and justify the ungodly. I know these things in my mind and in my thoughts and in my understanding and heart. I know these things. I know he's the only redeemer. What made the difference? What made the difference? The blood of Christ. If you want to come to a bloodless altar... A sacrifice, sacrifice less altar, a Christless altar, then get ready to die in your sins. But if you want to meet God and stand before God, unblameable and unreprovable, you come to God by that appointed Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shed his blood to take away our sins. The sacrificial Lamb is at Calvary, 
That's where he is. Who is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where he is. God Almighty will not do business with. He will not speak to nor be spoken to by any sinner except by the Lamb. And through the Lamb, the blood of Christ, the great high priest. We have an altar which to come. But it's, an, it's not an earthly altar. It's an altar in the mercy seat of, the glory, of glory on which the blood of Christ was placed when he died on that cross of Calvary. I plead the blood. I plead the sacrifice and the offering of Christ, my only righteousness before God, justification. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Not only do I know whom I have believed, but I am persuaded, I am convinced that he is able, that he is able, not only to save, but to keep. Keep us from falling, keep all that he purchased and accomplished before the Father. He is able to keep. Our Lord had not failed, and he has not failed. He's no weakling. He's not upset because the devil will not let him have his way, and the world will not let him do what he came to do. He's not upset about that. Our Lord is able. He is satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. He's able. No doubt about it. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which, and here's the third thing, which I've committed. Committed what? It all. Life, salvation, soul, hope for the forgiveness of sin. It's all committed to Christ. Now, this is a threefold definition of faith. I know, I am convinced, and I'm committed. The threefold definition. I've counted the cost and I'm committed. I would rather have Christ than all the treasures that this world has to give by his grace. By his grace. If I have Christ, I have everything. If you have Christ, you have everything. If I committed all my or I have committed all my idols and laid them at the cross, I've surrendered them. I've laid down my arms unconditionally. I've stacked them. It's over. Lord, I'm yours. Lord, do with me what you will. That's what Paul said, and that's what he's saying, and that is faith. Commitment. Commitment to Christ, counting the cost, following him. That's another mark of a believer. The rich young ruler would not do it. He wouldn't do it. It was too, too, the cost was too high. This whole thing, or this, this is a whole lot more than this, in this day of easy believism and decision-making. True faith is the gift of God. If you have that faith, if I have that faith, it's the gift of God. God's given that to us. It's not a decision to go to heaven. It's a vital union with Jesus Christ the Lord. It's not giving mental assent um, to some terms of theology. That's not what this thing is. It's a submission. Crowning Christ. It's, no, it's willingly bowing to the Son of God and resting in his finished work for all of their salvation. For all my soul. It's committal. Turn to Romans chapter 7 with me, please. Let's see what else Paul says about a mark of a believer. The believer is not without sin. He's not without failures. We have failures. We have valleys and doubts and fears, just like the unbeliever. But something has happened. He's been met. He's been confronted by the Lord, by the king. The king won. A believer has been, a believer has been to Bethel. He has had a confrontation with the Lord. And the Lord broke him and made him willing in the day of his power. He belongs to the Lord. A bond slave, a bond slave laying down at the master's feet. Paul said in Romans chapter 7 and verse 24, he says this, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the, this, from the body of this death? In other words, he's saying, I'm a hell-deserving sinner right now, right now. I'm a hell-deserving sinner. When he wrote that right then, I'm a hell-deserving sinner. God has shown me my sin in the light of his holiness, and I need delivered. That's what he's saying. But God does not leave his sheep in that frame of mind in that state of being. 
He didn't leave him. He didn't leave him in that. He brings us and drives us to Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need delivery, but the Lord is our delivery. He is not just my friend. The Lord is not just my friend, although he is my friend. That was, that was mentioned in prayer. He is our friend, but he's not just my friend. He's not just my brother, though he is. He is my Lord. Can call no man master. He, Christ, is my master. The great way to heaven, or the gateway to the kingdom of God is the lordship of Christ. It's not the buddy system. It's more than this. He is Lord. One day he said to disciples, he said, You call me Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. The disciples did not call him Jesus. But many in our day want to call him that. But no man can call him Lord but by the Holy Spirit. They want to call him Jesus, but we see him in his glory. We see, we, if we ever see him in his indisputable, immutable sovereignty, we just get a glimpse of it, but we see that. If we ever see him as king and master, we'll not have a problem calling him Lord. You know, it'll be, it'll be nat as natural to call him Lord as it is for us to call our, heaven, our, our earthly father, Dad. If we call our father and mother by their first name, we show them no respect. We lack respect and admiration. Sarah even called Abraham Lord. But he is my Lord. He says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus to be Lord, it's a committal to a sovereign Lord. Turn to John chapter 1 with me. Look at this. John chapter 1 and verse 12. John writes this, our Lord says, or John writes this, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as received. As many as received. It's a committal. Not a decision, a decision to accept him or not. It's when the spirit of the living God is open to sinner's heart, mind, to see the glory of God in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a committal. Like old Jacob, God brought him to Bethel. Old Jacob. God told him who he was. He said, I'm the Lord thy God. That's who I am. The living God. The God of Abraham and Isaac. The creator of this world. He showed Jacob there is a way to God. He showed him with that ladder that reached heaven and earth. That is Christ, that latter is. He made a covenant promise with Jacob. He talked to Jacob. He told Jacob, he said, I am, I'm going to keep you and bring you back to your land. And Jacob said, he's my God. Then last of all, and, and then I'll close, that which marks a believer is a constant return to this place of committal, of repentance and faith. You know, God brought Jacob to Bethel, and he spoke to him, and revealed himself to him, and he revealed the way of God to him, and he revealed himself through his word, and God spake to him and made him a promise. Old Jacob took a lot of detours, though. Jacob did. A lot of detours, and he wandered here and there. But one day, God told him to come back to Bethel. Changed his name, the house of God. Come back to Bethel. Changed his name. He used to be named Jacob, the supplanter, which means take by plotting. He did a lot of plotting, Jacob did. He had so many questionable character traits, but God changed his name. He said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, supplanter, but you're going to be called Israel, prince of God. That's your new name. Has that happened? Has that happened? Have we been to Bethel? Have we been to that place, not in front of the church, not the baptismal waters, not down an altar, or been to the school of theology, but have we been to Bethel, where God Almighty meets us, where he met Jacob? That's Christ. Have we been to, ba been to, ja have we been to Bethel? Not where Jacob met God, but God met Jacob. Just like God met the, the Saul of Tarsus. God met him. Have we been there? Where God spoke to him, where God revealed himself to him, spoke to him through his word, where God changed his name and made him a promise. 
and where Jacob made a committal. You know, Jacob's father, Isaac, loved Esau. See, that's Jacob's brother. Esau was Jacob's brother. He loved Esau. But uh, Esau had all these commendable traits and was more beautiful on the outside than Jacob. And, they, I, and, and, and Isaac loved Esau, but, he, but, he, but God didn't. God didn't love Esau. God loved Jacob. See, God doesn't look on the outward countenance. God looks on the heart. Jacob's heart was covered with the blood of Christ. God loved and justified Jacob in eternity. The difference is God's grace. Neither Jacob nor Esau deserved God's love or mercy. Neither one of them did. But as mentioned, Jacob means some planter. He was a cheat. That's what he was. Esau, though, he despised the birthright. He despised God. And he despised grace. Despised grace. He loved life. He loved people. He loved his father and mother. He loved hunting in the woods. He, but he hated God. So God loved Jacob and revealed himself to him. Strange and mysterious are the ways of God. And he moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. But God's not confined to this outward, count, out, outward appearance. He's not confined to that. God looks on the heart. And Peter, Peter would have had a hard time convincing John that he loved the Lord. See, John saw him curse him, and, or curse and swear and deny that he knew the, knew the Lord. He sat by that fire, and the other apostles, they knew about it too. And Peter ran and fled when the Lord was arrested. He would have had a hard time convincing anybody that he loved the Lord in that situation. But when Peter met the master, and the master asked him, the master met him, and the master asked him if he loved him, Peter said, Lord, you know I love you because you know all things. He does know all things. He knows us. He knows his own. We can put on our religious front all we want to, but have we been to Bethel? Have we met Christ? Have we rested in Christ for all of our salvation? Have we committed it to Christ? His people will have many mountains to climb, deserts to cross and waters to, to swim through and many valleys to walk through. But if we are his, we will always come back to Bethel. We'll always come to Christ, rest in him. We cannot find joy or peace anywhere else. He is, and, and, and he has everything we need. Again, he, has, he is all wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Have you been to Bethel? Have I been to Bethel? Have we committed all of our salvation to him? Have all security in him? Have we rested in him? If a man has Christ, he has everything, and he will keep coming back to Bethel by his grace. Amen.